Gooners, football fans, welcome to the podcast version of the Uncensored Arsenal live stream of Saturday, July 24th. Personal stories and family recollections of the history of Arsenal since 1927 by Stephen Mills, a three-generation Gooner. Special thanks to Blackburn George and Renka Rulo for their contribution. The message from Mills was there were difficult and glorious years. But to quote him, it was fantastic to be an Arsenal fan. Tune in for more. Gunas of the world, football fans. Welcome to today's Saturday, July 24th edition of the Uncensored Arsenal live stream. It is my pleasure to introduce the one and only Stephen Mills, 1978 Gooner. Stephen, your family has been supporting Arsenal since 1927, you tell me. Tell people about yourself before George, Blackburn George, fires away. Tell me a little bit about yourself as a gooner. When did you start supporting and your and how it relates to your family? Okay, so I started um, just before the cup final, 1978, around about the time of the semi-final against the Orient, as they were. In Could you days. speak up a little louder, uh, Milsey? Yeah, sorry, mate. Um... So, just before the 1978 Cup final, yes, and, uh, it was probably around about the time of the semi final um, against Orient that we won three 0 I think. Yes. So, and therefore, from the, from and from then on, the only thing I know about Leighton Orient was that they used to be their names used to be called on the football pools. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're straight back into the leagues now again, haven't they? But so, and then, and then before that. You know, I'm related to the people who, the guy who, one of the guy who really started Dull Square FC, and then Dull Square FC, right? Right, and then he was involved with um, starting the, uh, the, you know, Royal Arsenal. Uh, apparently, my mother told me just before Christmas or just afterwards that I'm related to Charlie Williams, who was the first goalkeeper at Arsenal, at Royal Arsenal. Really? I think he ended up somewhere in South America, something like that. So, and then my grandfather was an Arsenal fan as well, and but. He was like a, he's quite complex as an Arsenal fan because as a kid. Mills? Yeah. Millsy. Yes. You might have to come closer to the microphone because I'm okay. hardly hearing you. Are you hearing him, George? I can hear him, yeah. Okay. So, and, you know, my grandfather was an Arsenal fan. And although later in life he was a little bit more, he, he wasn't fanatical or anything like that, you know. Um, and, and as I said to you before, there was this, the legend of the 1927 <laughs> Cup final ticket. Wow, and uh, and he and always there was this idea that the ticket was kicking around somewhere in a box or, or something like that, and um, but it never got located. Um, Brenda Ruler, how about you? Hello, are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, how are you doing? I'm good, my friends. I'm good. I'm. I'm just glad that you can hear me this time round. Yes, you are. well. That's a what you were. You know, you, you were supposed to be one of the interviewers of of Mills Vengarula. You have been uh, um, Pakistan. You know the reason why I, I love hearing hearing from you. Most people assume Pakistan is just a big cricketing country, and you play hockey at an international at a very high level there. But how oh, on earth? Pakistan is supporting Arsenal and Bob in football. You are in football as an administrator, as a coach, and as a diehard supporter of Arsenal. How did you start supporting Arsenal? Oh, that's a long story. Long, long story. It was basically, I don't know if you still get those Panini cards in England. Um, but George basically, can my tell you, you still have Panini to... cards, George? Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, so my one of my uncles actually had gotten a fellowship uh, to the Royal College in England. Um, uh, he was a doctor. So he had gotten a fellowship and he had gone to London to practice. And my cousin came back with these paninis. And my first panini was actually Ian Wright. Really? So, yes, absolutely. So there's this you know, young black striker, uh, uh, and and my cousin had a collection of these cards. So he had the Crystal Palace ones, he had the Arsenal ones, but he had everything. And I kind of, kind of, you know, fell in love with this guy. Who is he? This guy is all swag. This guy is all style. Who the hell is this guy? But my first real Arsenal interaction was actually, it was at one of my aunt's house because at that time, early nineties. Uh, not everyone had satellite television. But those who did, uh, they could watch live English football. Right. And so I caught an Arsenal game at my aunt's house. And lo and behold, it was the same guy whose panini I had who had teamed up with some gentleman called Dennis Bergkamp. And they were <laughs> ripping apart Millsboro. Uh, Millsboro? Uh, oh, really? Was, I think a game at Highbury and they ripped Boro apart. And just those two, just those two. You don't you didn't even need to care who was in midfield, who was in defense. Just those really? two strikers, they just they just tore them apart. And I was hooked. This was Arsene Wenger's first year at at, at the club. And I was just hooked. I was like, okay, this is something I can I can get behind. Um like so many you... others, I was yeah, sorry, go on. Were you playing? Were you playing football at the time, or did you start playing football just because of the Arsenal? Um, I uh, didn't play football as much. I was more of a cricket guy at the time, but of course. football was something that was that was I was picking up um, at the time. More, um, I would say, when I, when I started playing, it was more of a goalkeeper and defense because there was a short, plumpish kid who was trying to run across. Um, so they would either put me in defense or they'd put me goalkeeper. Uh, but uh, over the years, it kind of became an obsession because the, it was Arsene Wenger, and you know his teams were his teams were just beautiful. You know, he just draw you in. Um, you... He had a physics teacher by the name of uh, Suhail. Yes, he was a Manchester United uh, fan, and so just as I was kind of getting into Arsenal. Uh, we landed in his class, and he used to go on and on about Manchester United, this Manchester United, that blah blah. blah. That year was the first year that Arsene Wenger had taken down Alex Ferguson. Arsenal won the first uh, double. Really? That year, when when we had our classes, our physics that was class. 90, 98, I think. As a, as a young 18, 19, 20 year old kid, that's how you know it was like, ah, the physics teacher, look, <laughs> we we won, you lost. So Mills, no, terrible anyway. All right, so you have your family going back. We had Vengarula, who uh, is supposed to be one of your interviewers, and we were talking to him about his Arsenal background. Well, he's back on, but you said your family goes back to the Royal Arsenal, and that one of your no, family the, members was a founder no, of Dial Square. Yeah, Dial Square. Going. He worked. Everybody, everybody, many people on my mum's side of the family worked for at the Arsenal, and um, and so. Um, he he was the guy who started Dial Square FC, and then he was still at the Royal Arsenal as well. When Dial was, Square FC is a predecessor to Arsenal, correct? That, that's right, by a few couple of years or a year, something like that. And then and then and then I, the, the family legend, from what I know, is that he was involved with sorting out the shirts from Nottingham Forest when they came. Other than that, but I've seen people dispute that. But he is in some of the history books and other things. He isn't involved, so. It's kind of one of those strange ones, but he is mentioned and he is a part of that. And so my grandfather, so later, obviously, you know, my grandfather worked at the Arsenal as well. And then it's really? a strange situation because he went up north during the Second World War to teach the people up there how to make bombs. Obviously working at the Arsenal. That's where he met my grandmother. Now, her brother, um, he married somebody else and his grandson ended up playing for Manchester United in goal. In the first team, he only played once because he got injured. So, yes. uh, so that was on a personal note. It was great fun when my brother and I used to play against them as kids. He scored against Manchester United. It was always a little small victory for us. 
a small a small anecdote, but it was it was funny. So there's that kind of connection with that. <laughs> and, my, and my grandfather, he 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 went he went obviously many times to the Arsenal, and uh, he was at the he went to the Real Madrid game that time when, and he told me the stories that everybody at half time said, "Winner, we'll beat them three 0 or whatever." You know, they came out and got whopped about 4-0, Arsenal did. But he still said it was fantastic to go and watch it. You know, it was just exciting to see that. Was that the Puskas team? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I don't, you know, he... I know, I know of him. (laughs) But he, you know, he he said that, you know, that if you were a kid at the Arsenal in those days, they would pick you up. If you were, you know, behind, they would pick you up and pass you over the top. And have you at the front so you could see the game. And they would say, don't worry, mate. He's all right down here. We'll look after him and all the other stuff, you know. And then he told yeah. me some other story about he was up in the West Stand when the West Stand was standing. I think it was standing upstairs as well in those days. And the, um, uh, and some guy was a pickpocket or some, something had gone on. And the police turned up. And he just said, he said, all these blokes everywhere just said, it was me, mate. No, it was me. And then he said, somebody on the upper tier at the West Stand said, oh, it was me. And so the policeman just gave up and went off yes. somewhere else. At that well, we all know that from um, the crowds. In most stadiums, you never can arrest anybody if the, if the fans are with you. So, Mills, before George asks you any question, you know, you, you go back to 1927 and you became a gooner or you started attending games in 1978. Tell us all about that. Well, I, d- I just had a friend, and he was he was really really into Arsenal, and I got into Arsenal as well. And that, like I said, probably about the time of the semi final against Orient, as it was in those days. And, uh, and then I remember watching the seventy eight final, and then going into that next season, and that was the season where Brady scored the the cracking goal against um, Tottenham. But what most people don't know is that at the beginning of the next season. We played against Leeds United and we drew 2-2 at home. And Brady scored almost exactly the same goal at Highbury against the North Bank. And he bent it in as well. It was on a lower angle. But if you look at it, you can find it on YouTube. And if you see it, and it's, it's, it's absolutely, it was absolutely fantastic. You know, so. Yes. So, that was a, you know. so, Bills, the whole point of having you say this is to say that your roots are deep. And you, you have been there since 78. And you yeah. saw your first trophy in 1988-89 under Graham. You uh, have been through late, Wenger. Late. Wenger Ruler is back. He joined, became a supporter because of Wenger. I became a supporter yeah. because of Wenger. Wenger is gone. But has things really changed? George, fire at him. Have, what, ha, what is the nature? Fire away at him. Let me not ask oh. you any questions. <laughs> I've set the table. Good. <clears throat> I'm Elf. Right. Hello. What I'm interested in is yeah. the the way it used to be for people attending matches. What was the feelings and what were the expectations as against what they are now? We know what they are now. They want to be top four. They want to be challenging for trophies. They want to yeah, sure. be yeah. entertaining. Think- they want a comfortable seat. They want... They want Everything on a silver platter. But tell me what it was like in those days and what the expectations for the normal fan were, you know, when you were going into a season. What were you hoping for? Obviously, you're hoping to win the league. But, you know, what were your reasonable expectations going in every year? No, I, I, there wasn't any. I loved Arsenal. There, there literally wasn't. I mean, you know, if you look at the league record in the first seven years that I was there, it's not, it's not very good. Yes. You know, of course, they, we were a great cup team. You know, the three cup finals and then the cup winners cup final. And there was a hope there. And it was, the, I, I think I think the feeling of losing in that time was worse than it is now. Really? Yeah. I, I mean, I was, a, I was a kid as well. And there's a classic cup winners cup final story I've got, which is um, at the time, you know, we were these London Overspill kids and we went on this school trip to, the, to Wales. And we were down there and that's when the cup winners cup final was on. And we're in this dormitory and there's a kid opposite me and he's got a radio, and I come and got a radio to listen to the game. And he's a spud, and he's and he's telling me what's going on in the game. And as it comes up, and Graham Ricks comes up to take the penalty, and he just says, "Arsenal have missed the penalty, and they've lost." Oh, and slowly, I just pulled the covers off over my head and turned over and so- silently wept in the corner. And it was this horrible, alienating feeling of like, how could they lose? And I loved them so much, those guys. And but but um, to follow up on George's question, 
would the fans have said that Graham Ricks is shit? I mean, I was I I was in the there Caribbean. Was a lot of fighting after that. There was a lot of fighting after that game, wasn't there? So oh really? There was a lot of frustration, and there was a lot of fighting in the old days. Uh, uh, I remember the first Tottenham Arsenal game I went to in nineteen must have been eighty eighty one season. Okay, so we got in the gra- ground. We we're in the West Stand at that point, and it was fighting really bad. I remember it really badly fighting in the in the in the corner just over to the left hand side and on the north bank, and it was like a pitch battle on the north bank. And wow. you know, you know, like it was. I mean, I was only about 10, 11, and I, I, I was. To be honest with you, I was really scared, like really scared, because you know, like the St John's ambulance or like those uh, the the what are the other the Maltese uh, Croats people, you know, the, those people. They were like taking, they were just carting people off from the north bank all the way down to the clock end or wherever it was to get them out of the stadium as they were injured. Mm. And I remember feeling really sorry for these old blokes, and they must have been utterly like bemused at what is this insanity that's going on. And it was literally a pitch battle. The police were down the middle, and the two sides of Arsenal and Tottenham fans would come in. And it was nil nil at half time. And this guy came up to me, and there was Tottenham fans literally everywhere in the stadium. I mean, it wasn't segregated or anything like that. And this guy came up to me, he must have been about 30, 35, and he just said, Oi, you, take a seat and watch your team lose. And I just looked at him, I just didn't know what was going on. And then the second half started, and we scored relatively early on, I think. And then the second goal, Frank St- all of my final memory of the game is Frank Stapleton getting this ball and lobbing it well into the goal. And I knew this bloke, he must have been absolutely fuming at me. And when he got out of the stadium, I wouldn't look at him. I just thought, I'm going to die here, do you know what I mean? But, that, but it was, I mean, it was overwhelming. It was massive. There was this incredible smell of tobacco and alcohol everywhere. This, this and piss. Aggression. And piss. Yeah. And these people, <laughs> the, and you know, one thing as well is that there wasn't the over, overload that we've got now. There wasn't endless interviews with people. You know, you, you had to look at Match of the Day or listen to Radio 2, uh, Radio 2 Live, and, um, which I did endlessly as well. Uh, my brother and I praying... When we were in the when the against York York City in the FA Cup and we were, and they had penalty in the last minute or whatever it was and when you sat there just praying to anything please let it not go in and it's even worse on the radio because you don't know what's happening you can't visualise it in any way whatsoever and of course they smashed it in and they won and it was utterly gutting but George I think the thing is that you could get up quicker I think that it got up got in a bit of a mood about it my dad will tell you it was I was always in a mood about it but you know my memory is different. But, uh, you know, and you went to school with, you know, you talk about it with your mates and those things like that. I, you know, uh, I had a friend who, who, was, uh, who, was in the, uh, who was in the Arsenal Supporters Club from the age of th- three months. And his dad had been a massive Arsenal fan. And he used to go, when he was a young man, he, w- he went to the games. He used to go into the ground at 12 o'clock in, in the afternoon just to be there because he loved Arsenal so much. He was a milkman. He got us tickets. And we went to the, uh, the Milk Cup final in 84. Now, again, people didn't move around very much in England. You know, if you t- listen to the specials of someone talking, they talked about when they got in their van and they went down to London to play their first gigs and it was like going to the ends of the earth. Yeah. You know, these rick- rickety old cars and everything. Anyway, so we went and, of course, the whole of Merseyside was there and because he got free tickets being a milkman. So, and we went in and we were in the Everton end and it, and it, was, utter, it was magic. I mean, it was utterly fantastic. I mean, it was nil-nil and they did a big parade at the end took a lap of honour, everyone was singing Merseyside, Merseyside. And I remember coming out and this kid was walking in front of me talking to his dad and saying, there could never be an atmosphere like that between London clubs. And I thought, sure. you, you're right, but you're wrong, because there was an atmosphere. And at that Tottenham game I went to, it was, it was, it was nuts. The atmosphere was incredible, you know. I mean, it's nothing like the Highbury Library years later when it was very quiet. But So I think, I think it was, but... You know, Arsenal, Tottenham, which is very, very aggressive. You know, uh, so. Yeah. Ruler, you're back. You, you are, you have. I want you to fire a question away at Mills because. Absolutely, I, I was wondering, uh, Mills. Uh, yes, ma'am. What has kind of? I mean, we've we've noticed that the Arsenal audience has kind of changed from a working class club. It has gentrified. It has been, you know, more middle class and. Uh, but one thing that has also changed is the ownership structure. I mean, by the, when you were when you had started, there was a board of trustees who were basically entrusted with this responsibility. That's right. Yeah, Dennis yeah? Wood. 
I, I, yeah, I, I just kind, kind of want to understand the sense of what was so different about that club. How was it constructed as a social institution that is kind of, you know, it has a place in its, in its, in its immediate community. That's what I want to understand. So yes. me, if I was really, really honest, I mean, first, first thing to add to what you're saying before is I think that the Arsenal is now really international. I think that's something that Wenger brought. I think that also there was the concentration then on the Champions League. And in my, this is my own personal opinion. Uh, and I, I think that, but in the old days, I think it was posh people running the club. You didn't have much to do with them. You know, Dennis would, uh, Dennis Hill would write something. Uh, I can just show you something as we go along. You know, at the, uh, the, that's, that's, know, that's the, the, that's the, that's the, um, that's the father, correct? That's, That's the right, father yeah. of the old Hillwood that we know, right? Yeah, so he would write something, you know, there, there he was, Dennis Hillwood. This is the first game I went, this was in the thing. In the, in the magazine. Uh, that's right, in the, pro in the program, yeah. The program, yeah. And, uh, you know, they got on with it, and that was it. You know, and we came along. I mean, it was very cheap. Uh, well, comparatively cheap. Here's, uh, this is... I've got How much was the ticket? I've got two tickets. This one is against Gothenburg when we won 5-1. And we went 1-0 down, first of all. And I remember this old bloke from the 1930s sitting next to me, and he said, don't worry, mate, we'll hammer him on this one. That'll wake him up. <laughs> you know those little phrases that always stick in you? Every time we go down 1-0 down, I always think, no, that'll wake him up. Of course, it doesn't always. But... And, and we won the game 5-1, and that was, that was, that was fantastic. Um, and that was £2.50 to get in the, in the wow. West Stand. And I think it was less than a quid to get on the North Bank. I was never in North Bank. I never went on the North Bank. I used to either go in the corners... Or sometimes in the in the in the stands, so uh, I'm a bit boring in that sense. But so I think it was just proletariat people. Maybe maybe there were some middle class people there. I don't know. And uh, and the posh people ran it, and it was all that was it. You know, you you could only go and find that information through shoot or match match magazines, something like that, which we used to buy. But mostly it was gossip and your mates and listening to the radio and look reading the programs. Or uh, shit, where is it here? Used to be this thing called the the Arsenal Handbook. I've lost the cover on this one, and it used to come. I don't know if they still do it, and it used to come out every year, and it's packed full of stats and facts and figures. This one's even got a complete in, incorrect printing with um, Clive Allen being signed. It'd be as like, great as it and, is today. Uh, you know, yeah. so yes, Clive so, Allen. Uh, um, Clive Allen, Arsenal and Spurs. But there's more Spurs now than Arsenal. Son of a right. gun. He, he, was, he, didn't, he, he came, didn't he? And then he left immediately before he even kicked the ball. So that was a kind of an odd one. But I think, you know, I think that Wenger, I think for me, Wenger made Arsenal international. It was him, you know, the players. I think it was already happening in Britain. I, I, remember, uh, I think Ruud Hullet really started things for me. For me, that was the way I saw it, bringing in players, moving it all around. And uh, I mean, it was a big deal when Viv Anderson came as well. I mean, I really like Viv Anderson. Again, it's back to the, you know, I like a lot of players who a lot of other people don't. And he got stick all the time about being an Arsenal reject during the games when he moved on. And I never understood why I liked him. And of course, my view, who cares, you know, but that was the way they felt about it. But I really liked him. I felt really great that Arsenal was moving on and different players coming in and stuff like that, you know. So, But once we became international, you know, I was thinking this today about how about who owns Arsenal. You know, it was really competitive when we, when we were kids and who's the big Arsenal fan. I've been to more matches than you and I've, you know, I, I've got all the accoutrements and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I came from a relatively poor family, so I never had an Arsenal top or anything like that. I've got scarves and I used to try and hustle the guys outside the grounds a little bit and always say, like, trying to get a badge or a rosette or something. And I always say, you know, it's, it's for my brother. And he did always say, that's a good one, mate, for your brother. I've heard that. And he would still knock a bit off and give me a bit cheaper, you know. So... You know, I couldn't really afford the Arsenal top or something. And it was gutting, you know. There it was, the 1979-80 kit, Umbro, 20 quid. <laughs> I was nearly crying I wanted it so much and couldn't get it, you know. But that's what life was like then, you know. People didn't have, you know, George will tell you, people didn't have much money. You did the best so, you could, you know. And Did you have, so to bring this back to George so he can follow up on what Ben Garula you have northerners like George supporting the club in such a passionate way. George, is that a fair question? No, that wouldn't have happened. No, but there wasn't. The internet and uh, Sky Sport made it possible for remote fans to be deeply, feel deeply involved. Local fans will tell you they're not deeply involved, but yes, 
you can feel deeply involved. Like Rangarula there over in Pakistan. You can feel involved with Arsenal. You can feel part of Arsenal because right. there's so much contact with the club, so much going on, so much information, so much interaction on social media platforms uh, that you can actually feel involved. No, that could never have happened in the old days uh, when I was younger. No, it just wasn't on. You would have had to have some family link. It would have had to be your dad supported Arsenal and was from London originally, something like that. Or you would just have supported a local team. Could never happen, no. Well, I like to tell you guys that the only international team that I grew up was Manchester United. They, I mean, they, they, the English media, and uh, Ben Garula can tell you that. I mean, if you went to your local library, there are books about Bus Busby Babes, you know, I mean, it's only, it, in the case of Jamaica and the Caribbean, you had, um, you know, when those black guys start going playing for Arsenal or for Watford or for, so, or, and John Barnes going to Liverpool, I told you that story before. But he was at Watford, by the way. He was. You know, he, people's play. loyalties begin to divide. <laughs> Here he is, mate. Sorry, but, but it was only Manchester United. We, in the, in the colonies, had to refer to as a football oh, yeah. team. <laughs> because they had been winning for so long that there was already this 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 huge thing of we are are with the winners. So by the time Arsenal came, well, by the time Arsenal Wenger comes around, and we are looking at this gorgeous, sexy football, and it's you know it's like it's different, yes, and it's potentially better than Manchester United, oh yeah, and it's potentially yeah. sexier and, and and everything, right? So, I mean, literally, this is a 16, 17, 18 year old guy who's just watched one game, who's watched two strikers pull apart a grown a team of grown men, of 11 men, and just these two strikers are pulling them apart. And there's this old, well, there's this guy standing there, you know, lanky, tall man, and who's clapping from the sidelines. And it's like, whoa. And, you know, of course, being international and being a kid, first time experience, you know, everyone's thinking, Oh, so this guy made this club, right? So Arsen and Arsenal. So you have that kind of misconception as well. That kind of helped, actually. But yes. you have those kinds of things as well. Now, for a kid to come out and... Because you have to understand, a lot of bullies in school supported yes. Manchester United. The worst kind of humans supported Manchester United, <laughs> even in Pakistan. Right? So... Well, you didn't Garula, want to be a Manchester you're United a lot of, You're learning a lot of points here for Arsenal fans. Keep going, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's, a, it's a very different experience, right? It's, it's As George says, you know, it's now you're a global citizen. You are connected. You, are, you have an opinion. You can potentially even apply for a job to Arsenal. You know, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's so global now. Uh, back at that time, it wasn't, it wasn't that way. In fact, even up to 2010s, it wasn't that way. So, for example, if I were to have, have met Mills, my apologies for the dogs. Uh, for example, if I were to have met Mills on, on social media, on Twitter, you know, there was obviously going to be for a few years, there has been, well, there had been a lot of, you know, distrust amongst each other. Who is this guy? Where is he from? You know, who is this woman? Where is she from? Why Why is she tweeting about Arsenal? The woman might be from Croatia. The man might be from freaking Australia. It was just, just, we kind of took a few years just to get to know each other in an online forms, in online communities, just to understand that, all right, you know, these guys go to the games, well done. We also have opinions. We stay up at night, you know, we also, our love is also genuine. Um, I so, mean, I, 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 I sorry. So I, I'm, I'm just, it's, it's very interesting knowing Mills and George, who, who, who had these family connections to Arsenal, who've gone to these games. And it, it, it's very interesting when they talk about their relationship with, with, with the intimacy that the club had. Right? So... The but I want to ask Mills though, that, that, ruler. I want to ask Mills hmm. as a follow-up to what you're saying and what George said. M uh, Mills, how much is it better and how much is it worse? I'm going to ask you. This internationalization of Arsenal. Oh, I, 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 
I, I don't have any problem with internationalisation of anything. I, I don't. I, like, on my side, that's not a problem. The person who's who's not in living in England or whatever, and they want to be part of it, they are part of it. It's like that yeah. story that was in Richard Barnes's book about mods. You know, the mod, the mod who's in a little small provincial city somewhere, sitting in an horrible cafe with his with his burger that's all flaccid. He's just the same as the London mods or whatever. He's part of the dream. He may not be part of it directly in some way you can go to the games and buy all the equipment or whatever they're still part of it it's, it's not the same anymore like it was it's just not everybody's part of it everybody's in it i, I think that's a great thing i don't see why well I mean, look i've got no claim to the club i don't own the club i'm uh, i think we're caretakers i know that sounds a bit hippie and i don't mean it in that sort of sort of a dumb way like that but we're here for a short time on the planet and we look after it and i don't really like the way that people are looking after the club at the moment well, we'll come to that, but you know... And I think we did look after the club in the past, even when we were really struggling, uh, you know, after the Brady era, you know, we struggled for a long time. I was looking at those players in the, in the, in the programmes, and we did the best we could for a long time. And George came in, George Graham, and he started, like, pulling it together, and he was sort of, you know, up and down, and then, and then it got pretty good, you know, with him. So that takes us to the contemporary era. Can I, can I, can I, can I ask something? Yes. yes. Since George has... Now, George Graham... Uh, there is currently a, a, a divide between, between, let's say, those who loved George Graham more and who grew up in that generation versus those who grew up in Austin Wenger's time. And a lot of people kind of see Mikkel Atterter to be the second coming of George Graham. Do you, do you feel that's the way? And do you feel that the rebuild that's happening is, is, is cast in the same way? Or are there significant differences? Who's that one for? For That's me, for you, I mean, Mills. You are the you are the man of the moment. Uh, <laughs> but I want to hear George's uh, opinion on that. By the way, when you're done, no, George Graham had, he had a strong defence. I don't. Uh, is, Ar, is Arteta's defence as good? I, I don't. I don't know. I, I, no, I don't think he is. I don't know whether he's going to make it through to Christmas. I, that's what I think. I, I mean, who cares? It's speculation. I've got no idea what's going to happen. I think. I think that. I think Emery and Arteta have caused an incredible amount of destruction, and I don't, I don't know why it's happened. I can't think why the players know why it's happened. I was thinking today about how it must have been for those Emery sides because they cruised a long time on what had gone on with Wenger, and then it kind of, like I said to you the other day, it was that that time. I know other people on PA were fed up a lot of time, long time before, but it was that night when Notre Dame was burning and and we were playing against Watford, and it just fell apart. And that was that was it. You just feel this is it's finished. Anything that we were doing playing in. How, do, how much did we lose? I didn't check that result. How much did we lose to Watford that night? That was one of the first times yeah, we lose to Watford two, in the league, two. didn't it? Isn't that correct? No, Don't no. worry about the result. We, we it was the first time we had lost to Watford for years. Yeah, since these two games, these these ones here, these two games I went to see, and <laughs> it was it was horrible. It was horrible. <laughs> it was, I think it was the first time we lost to Watford in the Premier League. That's, I think that is what it is. And you're saying that it was just you. It struck you very much. Yeah, that was the point when I just switched off, and that was not it. And I, I remember coming on and saying, and, and Eddie said, "So I can't believe that you've, uh, you know, you know." He said something. I can't remember what it was. Like, oh, so you finally like lost your tolerance or whatever. It was really funny what he wrote, and I just felt like. Why oh, have I tolerated this so long? And you know, and we were trying to hold on to the positive ethic for a long time at PA, and, and it wasn't it wasn't possible. It isn't it wasn't possible. This is that positive, George. So, um, what what are your what are your thoughts about that? Well, on a general note, about I have a theory that football fans are generally tribal. You know, it used to be the old-fashioned you had a tribe of Arsenal fans against a tribe of Tottenham Hotspur fans. And it was all about confrontation. You know, your own little tribe and confrontation with the other tribe. The trouble is now, there's tribes within tribes. Yes. Tribes within the Arsenal fan base. And we're following the same confrontational route. We're competing and fighting against other Arsenal fans. Because now we can. Because the internet allows us to. And you see it over every new player, every old player, every manager. There's a divide. Mm -hmm. People on one side fighting, and they're convinced they're right. They're absolutely convinced they're right. 
And on the other side, they're also convinced they're right. And neither side's listening to the other. And there's a lot of people in the middle looking and shuffling to one camp or the other, depending on whether we win, lose or draw in the week. But it's all about confrontation these days, I think. It's like it's taken supporting in a different way, you know. To be a supporter now, you have to be more and more confrontational with the other side. So you need another side to argue with. The whole situation's getting it's a bit bit like the country. It's getting more, in my opinion, more divided uh, as as time goes by. And uh, I don't think George, do you feel football is more like religion now? Equally, as, religion. equally. I mean, I'm saying that because 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 too much of religion gets too much. Yeah. yeah. You know, and and so I mean, I'm just going back to what Mills was saying about you know watching transfers on 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 BBC, for example, in match of the day. You know, you'll have one or two news about it. You won't have that constant onslaught of information, twenty four fucking seven, right? Yeah. It's too much information, and it's too much. Anxiety causing the information these days. That is what feeds into into these tribal camps that you're talking about. I mean, that's it's a fabulous point that Mills was making about about that time where information was controlled. It was, you know, we received two drops out of a sea. You know, you know it, it gave us it gave us time to consume that, to understand that, to kind of feel all of those things, to feel our feelings. Now it's instant. You need to feel instant emotion, right? The That's unhealthy, I, I feel. Go ahead. The difference was we used to argue about facts. We have signed Malcolm McDonald. Now we'll have an argument whether we should have signed Malcolm McDonald or not. But that's a fact. We've signed him. Now we can have a hundred arguments about players that we're not going to sign, that we were never going to sign. But we're arguing about them. We're fighting about them. This James Madison in camp. There's a James Madison. There's a lot of shite camp. And there's James Madison's worth twenty million. There's James Madison's worth eighty million. And we're arguing about something that isn't a fact. It's a speculation. We're fighting about speculation most of the time. We're fighting about what Arteta is supposed to be doing. We're speculating about where he's going what his problems are, what his direction is. We're speculating it and we're arguing about it. Whereas we used to only be able to argue after the event of losing a game of football. You know, that was Well, it. you know, George, George, and even, you're and even right. Then, you're, even then you only had a few friends in the pub or your mates at yeah. school or your work friends. There's only very few people. You know, and, and the, me and my mate. Sorry, go on. go on. The big difference was... You get a smack in the mouth if you took it too far in the pub. Now you can't give anybody a smack. Nope. You've got to. You, anybody can say anything they want in any way they want and upset as many people as they want without getting a smack in the mouth. There's let me no tell restraint. You something, George, let me tell you guys you something. You know. George, let me tell you something. If you and I, if you tell a guy that he's talking shit on Twitter, he reports you and you're banned. Okay. You tell him he's a nonce, you're almost in trouble. You have got to, this is crazy. And therefore, the guy can come up and say anything. And it's, it's a, you know, the um, social media feeds this. I, I am convinced of it. But let me, let's go back to Mills. And, uh, you know, Mills, I check this. Throughout your career as a supporter, you have seen 12 managers. You may, may not have counted this. But you have seen 12 managers, the last three in the last three years. How is this transition, this new manager, how is this compared to what you have seen in the past? You've spoken about the you spoken about the leaving of Brady, and it was just and you've said that it was just as bad as Van Persie. You didn't go into it, but you know, just because a lot of people don't even remember Brady. But what about today? The transition of managers, how does that compare to when you you were a fan in, as when you were a fan in 1978 coming coming up. For sure. I don't know, we just went through that fellow period until George came in. But I like those, I know I like Don Howe. I liked him. 
I thought he's a good guy, you know. I um, Mills, even... Mills, Mills, Sorry, always keep close to the mic. Yeah, okay. go ahead. I like Don Howe. I thought he was a good guy, you know. I, it, it, I was a young boy as well, you know. So, and I think, I think something, you know, Brady left because he said that Terry Neal and the club didn't want to go in the direction he wanted to go, go into. And he felt they could have gone further. And for some reason or other, it wasn't going in that direction. Well, I don't, I don't know. It went into, it was very difficult. I would say after going in, just my memory of it, going into 82, 83, 84, maybe 85 as well. You know, the, 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 the attendances were really down from what I remember. And it was at a low ebb in the club and, you know, other people have probably got other memories that it wasn't like that, but that was, that was the way I remember it. And we got a lot of players in who were great, who are just forgotten now. Oh, and don't get mentioned people like Tony Woodcock. I mean, he held the Arsenal up as far as I was concerned. I mean, he was, he was fabulous. But I remember we played in, a, I, can't remember what year, I can't remember what year it was, maybe 83? Somebody else will remember. And we played against Manchester United in the semi-final of the Cup. And if you look at the game now, you think Arsenal got a chance at the beginning of the game, and they didn't. There was something at the club where we was like playing with concrete boots on all the time. You're struggling, you're struggling in... in it was something wasn't working. I, I don't know what it was. Was it Don Howe? I don't know. Did George have a better idea of things when he came in? Certainly things picked up and, you know, there was more hope there. Of course, then there was, the, you know, a few shuffle and scrape years with the, in the League Cup finals, but it got things going, you know. And, um, you know, poor old Bonnie Prince Charlie, when he came, that didn't work out. And there was too much hype on him at the time as well, too much pressure on his shoulders, you know. But, who, who you called Bonnie Prince Charlie? Oh, what's his name? Who came down? Charlie Nichols. Yeah, Charlie Nichols. The king of the king of the mullets. Oh, okay, he, okay, okay. He, and you know, yeah. I remember that. I remember when he came and there was that thing in the sun where he had these little. I, little I, pistols, I, I, I thought you all called him champion, shooter. George. And uh, you know, he was the he was the big hope, and it didn't it didn't work out. And I don't know the transition. I don't know whether there was a transition in the way that there was because I don't think there was anybody but like Wenger at the club. I mean, Wenger to me just took it, turned it upside down and he was this incredible side playing incredible football for a long, 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 long time. And, and, so you know, and so he, you're saying that um, Graham was just an evolution from, from Dan Holden? Yeah, I mean, or, from, or, or from everything that had gone on before. That's my, that's my opinion. Other people might have something and say that's completely wrong, but that was the way I perceived it. Yeah. I just felt like when Wenger came in, I really felt like this was something so shocking. Those two first doubles. I mean, you know, nearly back to back. And if you look at the stats, you know, the year when Manchester United did the treble, what did we lose? We lost that. Do you remember that semi-final? I remember going out to do an exhibition somewhere in that Manchester area. And they had that semi-final games being sold, double video, and it just said the epic. And, and of course, it was one of the most horrible matches ever for an Arsenal fan. But there was nothing like it. I remember I'd been 30 just a few days, uh, the day before the first semi-final when it was nil-nil, and I remember I was soaking up the pressure from them, and, and I had a pretty bad hangover that day as well, <laughs> watching that game with my brother in the pub. And then it came to the evening game, and, I, and I just what a game it was. I mean, I remember I'm on the radio, and they were saying, Manchester United must capitulate now. This is only Arsenal. And then poor old Paddy decides to give the ball to Giggs. Yes. We did, you know, we didn't make it through to the cup final. And then O'Leary doesn't lie down in the last game. Now, there's no reason why he should. And Leeds were very competitive at that time as well. And so, I think, what was it, a draw? They beat us 1-0 or something. So, we missed out on the league by about, what was it? You know, one, one point. One point. Oh, sorry, yeah. and, then, and then Manure, they, you know, they did the, you know, they won the Champions League in the last second, which was unbelievable as well, really. You know, all fairness to them. So, again, all the time with Wenger was this closeness. And as soon as the big money, you know, the new money clubs came in, that was it. And... Then you start to see what a remarkable job Wenger did with the players that he was grabbing and how he was training them and playing them. And there's nobody, there was nobody like him. And there's nobody like him now. Nobody can get hold of a team like he can and change it around and give us something special. Well, they're going to say you're biased. They're going to say you're biased, Mills. George, is that what they're going to say? Of course, I'm an Arsenal fan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether there's any objectivity anyway. I think there's only subjectivity, but... Even so, I'm just saying about how it, my experience of what it was like. It was nothing like him before, and there's certainly not been anything like him since, that's all. And, you know, 
I wish there had been. I wish, I wish that the club had got together and said, look, let's get somebody in and carry this, not get rid of everybody. You know, you guys, when you were talking, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, and you were saying about the players that left, you know, when, em- when, Emery, when Emery came in, and it's, it's shocking. It's... <laughs> oh, you know, it's like the exodus. <laughs> everybody left. Okay, everybody did. Well, he let them go. He let them go. He didn't, they didn't just leave. He let them go. George, fire question. Oh, uh, you must have another question for uh, Mills. Or comment. No, I'm, I've, I've had enough of this now. <laughs> why, are you so, why are you so boring, Mills? <laughs> but, but, but certainly, Mills, you're saying that this has been a shocking transition. No, it's failed, isn't it, really? All right, but I'm most people disagree with you. you. Okay, I've got a question for you guys. Do you think we would have won, what was it, the quarterfinal game against Sheffield United? Do you think we would have won that game if there'd been a full stadium at Sheffield? Because I don't think we would have done. They had the strongest 12th man in the league at that time, and they missed it last season, and look what happened to them. They were tough. They were tough to beat there. Would we have beaten them? You know, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I have you. You did fire one there at me. That's a surprise. Bengal ruler, you take you take a stab at that. I mean, I I I'm actually one going thing. to ask another question. I'm going go to ahead, ask another ahead. question. I I I I wanted to understand how was it uh, when when George kind of came in and the boring boring Arsenal, the one nil to the Arsenal became a, you know from a joke it became very very uh, well. I didn't care. I didn't care. You know, we were winning. It was fine. If you look at a lot of the games, it wasn't just 1 0. How was it? Oh, what was the emotional process behind it? And did you guys even have the imagination that a different kind of football was possible? I mean, currently, our generation has that imagination that a Wenger ball kind of thing exists, right? And we can have something of that sort. But when, when George was around, um, I want to understand whether. whether you know, people accepted it wholeheartedly that this is the this is the game that we'll play. I think there was different periods in George Graham's time as well, like there was with Wenger. There's different 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 eras, different periods of how they were playing the football. I mean, if you if you look at eight, you know, everybody everybody knows '89, and uh, if you look at that season, we were playing some pretty nice football, I would say. And even if that even that game against Liverpool, you know, it wasn't this wasn't boring boring Arsenal. I mean, we, know, won when it. we did when they, when we did score that goal and we won it. You know, that was one, that was now that was an incredible moment, yeah, really an incredible moment. Because I remember that I, I want to tell you a little boring stories about this that happened. Because some of it I was thinking today about how Arsenal weaves in and out of your life. We went, I went to the game. It's very sad because I went with one of my friends who who died 20 years ago. But he, we went with a game with him, and we went to Arsenal Newcastle, and that was the day of Hillsborough, and. That was pretty shocking what happened. And I think Brian McDermott scored a couple of goals that day. Anyway, we went back up to, to college and the guy in the room next door to me had gone to Hillsborough. Now what happened was he went into the he went into the he went into the into the stadium and he went into that pen and he said, This is a terrible, this is a terrible position. I'm not gonna go. And he went off, he managed to get off to another side. And that saved his life. Anyway, so I went back up and he wasn't there when you know when we went got back to the place where we all lived or whatever so I phoned him up and I got hold of his mum and his mum all the lads were all hanging around and you know as I did it and his his mum was crying on the phone they'd obviously lost somebody in the disaster and I said is Mark there thinking he's dead you know no 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 he's coming back he's, co- he's coming back tomorrow don't worry so he came back and he told us all about how utterly horrific it was and anyway we went I remember I remember as it went on and Arsenal just completely started capitulating towards the end and it, it was just this insane you know the insane statistics with everything and then i remember the west ham game and i remember it being in midweek or whatever it was or when, a few days before i can't remember and lying there listening to it on the radio and thinking come on you know come on your arms give us a give us a break it and they didn't I think they lost the i can't remember what it was four one i don't know five three one i can't remember and he went to that game, and it was and this kid I lived with. He, came, he was a he was a Chester City fan. He came up to me and said, "I tell you, man, Arsenal are going to do this because it's a really weird number. It's going to be two 0 And a bloke I lived with, well, a guy I knew in that house pretty well. His dad was lifelong you know, We watched that game, and when that second goal went in, you mean the Mark remember, Thomas goal? I remember the beer cans just we threw them up in here, and there's all these big stains on the ceiling. Mm-hmm. But then afterwards. 
that last, that last period of time when he flicks it back to Lukic, and then later it gets booted out and Perry goes, and then it's ended. I remember my hands shaking. And then running in the street after, and there was nothing in the street, because of course there was no Arsenal fans there, because we were living in Preston or whatever. I just couldn't believe it was such a, it was like such a, such a surreal moment. It was beyond all your dreams. What was Arsenal? They were going to win the league. They weren't going to win the league. We were a bit of a cup team, you mm. know. And there, there was that moment. And mm. then poor old Mark, the guy who had been at Hillsborough, he came back that night. And we all thought he's going to be in a massive mood. He just came up to me and shook my hand and said, well played, mate. He, he said, you guys, you guys, that was unbelievable. Yeah. Years later, I dated a girl who lived in Liverpool. <laughs> and when I met her family for the first time, I met her brother. And I asked him if he remembered that game. And he just looked at me and said, yes, I went to that game. <laughs> <laughs> he did go. And I put, personally, I felt really sorry for the bloke. But Arsenal didn't have very magic, many magic moments, in, in my opinion. I don't, th- I don't think we did. Some of the football was sterile. Were we, were we more tolerant in those days? Yes, I think we were more tolerant. I think, yes, it was boring Arsenal, but it wasn't always boring Arsenal. And then Wenger changed it around completely and utterly. And, uh, and so as soon as he leaves, we don't play particularly interesting football anymore. Do we? You think we do? I'm, I'm not sure we do. Well, me and, George, me and George talk about this all the time. I don't want this to be about our opinion today per se but um mills you're suggesting that we don't play interesting football and i was like relatively i was i told you yesterday i wouldn't spend the two thousand dollars that i spent to go and watch venga ball in 20 the last time i did was 2018 so that's to tell you the difference between the ball today i wouldn't spend that kind of money i don't know about you venga ruler because it costs a ton load of money. A lot of people realize this. For us to come from the Caribbean or from Pakistan or from India or from anywhere in the world to come and watch football. I'd... So if you want to talk about voting with our pocket, that's the problem. You're not going to have many of us voting with our pocket with the kind of football today. But also, <laughs> do you think like in the old days, like years ago, I don't know whether fans, you know, you picked your club and you just stuck with it. Yes. You know, I don't know whether I don't think expectations were as high. Look, Champions League. When we went to that Champions League final, this was beyond my thinking from my experience of being an Arsenal fan. He got us into he got us into the you know top class. It was just beyond beyond everything. And those are the two games I can't watch: the, the Champions League final and Game Fifty. I said this the other day to you, you know, because it's just don't let don't let my blood boil. There we go. Uh, but you know, the Champions League is just it's beyond. It's beyond everything. This wasn't the Cup Winners' Cup final, the Fairs' Cup, or... You know, those were fantastic moments. I, I didn't see the Fairs' Cup. That was before my time. But I knew people who did, and they said how fantastic it was, you know. And, uh, but... I don't, I don't know. The Champions League was beyond, beyond, my, beyond my thinking. Beyond Arsenal's thinking. But then after that, how many people had come into the club and they thought, this is normal, Champions League football all the time? <laughs> you know, because, because I, you know, think... For me, Wenger was so incredible because also it was like nothing I'd ever seen. I've never seen this at Arsenal. You know, okay, so the early, te- my early, you know, my sort of 78, 79, sort of 79, 80 period, you know, was I re- it was fantastic to watch, you know, Ricks and Brady play. I remember the old guys, the old gaffers at Arsenal, they'd always say, bloody hell, it's always down that left-hand side. And they were, they were fabulous. I mean, people just were applauding the things that were going on. But as much as I love Liam and I... I I said about the dimple and doing the moves up the park and emulating him and thinking, you know, my mate went in the competition to try and win his boots, you know, from Match Magazine without the studs in it. That's, a, that's what we thought of this guy. But he wasn't Mesut Ozil. Nowhere near. But Mesut was like, to, Mesut to me is like a, a small genius. You know, like I really mean a real genius. I, I, I don't just mean like everybody's a genius these days because you write something interesting or, you know, you've written a nice song or something. I'm talking about something... Geniuses are very, very few, and they change the human race. To me, the way that guy played, his intellect. And all right, everybody moaned about he didn't get back. He goes missing in games. So did Brady. Go look at the games now. Go look at them. What did Brady really? No. Was he really? Was he really controlling the games or playing them around? I don't think he was. But don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, uh, the players that have come through Arsenal, through the Wenger years. I mean, they were just. It just. It's just. Utterly fantastic to watch them. It was just fantastic. 
And they lost a lot of the time as well. It's just something everybody forgets. It wasn't all... I remember going up to Sunderland. My brother was working up in Newcastle. We got some tickets with his mate. And uh, and uh, we went down to see... We went to see... We were in the stands. And it was, it was an horrible day. It was cold. I had the best fish and chips of my life on that day. Absolutely incredible. And they were, they were good. They were nice people. And they sussed us that we were Arsenal fans, right? And they said to us, are you students? <laughs> so we were, of course, really offended by this because no one wants to be called a student. And then he goes, you're bloody Arsenal fans, aren't you? He said, yeah, yeah. And he said, don't worry, you're all right. Of course, we lost. But, you know... It Your was accent magic. gave you away. Your accent we gave you away. You don't, have a, you don't have a Geordie accent. Should Forget it. The old, the old anyway, my mate, we were, I can't remember who it was. My mate Matt was in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the supporters club in three months. He went to see Arsenal sometime in the mid-80s. <clears throat> and I can't remember what the score line was. We, we lost really loads, like five or six nil. I can't remember. Wow. And he just said to me, I said, how was it, you know, on Monday morning when he came into school, how was it? And he just said, it was magic, mate. It was magic. I said, what do you mean? We just lost like five mil. He said, no, 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 it was magic. And that attitude, that's what it was like in the old days, at least as we were growing up. It was still this incredible moment. I can't tell you what it was like to go in that stadium on the 21st of August, 1979, and see come down through the back of the East Stand and smell all the tobacco and the, and the beer and all these adult men in this place, how strange it was to be a little kid. And there's Pat Jennings kicking the ball around, warming up the other guys. I can't tell you what it meant because there was no overdose in those days. It right. wasn't endless. There wasn't a website for Arsenal. There was the handbook. Here it was. And I read it every day. <laughs> it didn't, yeah. I didn't read anything else. I read this. Yeah. I looked at the endless stats, and it is endless stats in here. You know, everybody playing, and I always used to go through the games. When we lost against Swindon, 4-3 in the, in, in the second leg of the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the League Cup. And I refused to believe we lost. I'd look at that lineup and say, how does that team with Brady and Sunderland and Stapleton and Riggs and, and David Price and probably John Hollins or whoever, how do we lose? We couldn't have lost. We won. We won. I wouldn't let it, I wouldn't let it sink in. Ah, oh, that's bullshit. But that's what it was like being an Arsenal fan. It was incredible. And then there was this horrible time when we lost to York and it was gutting and you just, you took it. And then we lost to Oxford in the bloody League Cup that time. And that, you know, that was an incredible game. And the Manor Grounds got well gone now. But that was, it was excellent. And we could just about get Radio Oxford at that time on, you know, if you swung the area around a bit. <laughs> and I remember listening into the, to the, trying to listen into the, the radio on that one because it wasn't, wasn't live on radio. What well, was Radio 2 then? There was no Radio 5 live. It was Radio 2. And um, it was, it was, it, we lost, but it was bloody fantastic. The games were so exciting. They were, you, you know, to, to me, you know, maybe I'm naive and I don't know enough about football or some other crap. I don't know. Somebody else has got a bigger opinion than me because they've got a big Twitter account or something. It doesn't matter. I wanted to say before I came on that, you know, I'm not, I'm not the guru. I'm just a bloke who supported Arsenal for a long time. I was lucky enough to have some family connections, but to be really honest with you, I found out those about years later. If I'd have been at school, it'd have been fantastic. You know, yeah. Miller, Miller, you know, Miller, Miller fucking is, you know, his, his great uncle or whatever started the Arsenal. That's a good one to play at school. But, but I don't feel that competitive about it. I don't feel like I own Arsenal. I feel like, I don't think it's the marriage. I was thinking about this today. It's not a marriage at all. Because if you're in a marriage and you don't like somebody, you're not going to stay in it, are you? Not, not really. You're going to leave. And I can't leave Arsenal. What can I do? I, everybody on PA, I think they, you know, for me, I think they, I love coming on there because I think they know more about Arsenal than I do. I can find out what's going on. I can find out about other people's opinions. Hopefully, sometimes I can write something that's relative, relatively okay and people like that maybe as well. And it's like a community of people that I haven't got. So I'm really grateful for that. And it's like going, you know, coming in on Monday morning at school and talking to your mate, you know. I only had my mate Matt, you know. The other guys didn't support Arsenal in my class or whatever. They were Watford fans or whatever. They were, whatever, you know, Chelsea or something like that. So, you know, when you've got those kind of mates, you... I, don't, I know my brother was a big Arsenal fan as well, so he joined about the same time as I did. So, you know, he, he went to a, a, a stack of games and stuff like that as well. So, you know, he'd always be talking about these things. And it's having that community. And now the community's massive. This is back to what George is saying about it's broken. It's just... Classic postmodernist malaise. Sorry to be pretentious about it, but if modernism was a ball, postmodernism is somebody getting the hammer and hammering the crap out of the ball, and we're all in these little pieces. But it's like, how do you get on? How does it? How does it work? And it doesn't at the moment because 
the internet in the last 10 years is a relatively sort of yes in the last 10 years the intensity is really in like a new phenomena in a way and it's pulling everything apart now i'm criticizing arteta and the way the lads are playing and those things but i couldn't do any better i couldn't otherwise i'll be in the job <laughs> you paid millions not talking to you guys <laughs> well you know you guys well you know shaping. well you know you know mills um i'm gonna ask george to and george and uh, george and wenger ruler to to pose the last question but i'm gonna say to the the audience out there we, we're We've been up and down. We're not down to three, three, three um, listeners. And uh, I'm going to tell all the people who listen to this and view this, this, this live stream. And need, we need you to hit that like button on YouTube and subscribe. Because that's the only way we're going to get um, anywhere in terms of attention. Because you get to the bottom of the heap on YouTube if you don't have subscribers. It doesn't matter how good your content is. But the point I want to make is that we, we need... There's a lots of people like you, Mills. You know, people, honest people who want a place where they can discuss Arsenal without having a million people telling them that they are cunts and well, they don't know then, anything. Then we need people like George. And the reason, the, see, what I liked, I really liked Untold, and I really liked going over there, and I really missed guys like Indra Brickfield, Gun, Brickfield Gunners. We're very good friends with him offline as well. He's a really lovely bloke. I couldn't stand getting slagged off all the time and being, you know, and then make aspersions about you and all these things. It's not, all right, it was, I'm not a school anymore, you know, this is not 1981. Yes. And I like George's policy. I liked his door policy. It was strict. All right? It was super strict as well. And it was extremely intolerant. And it was really great because it was like being this special underground nuclear bunker. George yes. did all the dirty work on Twitter, fighting everybody. And we could just like talk. <laughs> And have a relatively good time, you know. Okay, George, your last question, and Bengaroola, you will have the last after that. After that, George, fire away. Well, I don't really have a question that that, 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 would, that, would, that would interest Mills at all. Uh, oh, come on, come on. I just like to thank you for coming on and uh, and, and, and curing and, insomnia. And, and no, and telling us, you know, what it what it was like because. I don't know, you know, I don't know what it was like because I'm living in Blackburn and uh, I just wanted to know whether it had changed and, I, and it has changed. Yes, uh, it has. It changed. You know. It changed. It, it was always changing. It always changed. The 78, look, it's a really weird thing. Look at the kits for the 1978 Cup Final. Look at the kits for the 79 Cup Final. Look at the haircuts. Everything changed immediately. And they went. They decided to come into the modern world. Now there was a couple of other teams who were already doing it. Manu were doing it, and so was Southampton and a few others. They already had more modern kits in '76, and then it changed. And then it, and then the '80s started. And it was new kits and a new time when we went into that. And then all the way through the '80s, it was changing all the time. Probably people were more tolerant. It wasn't overdosed with endless interviews, endless. Uh, you know, there was nothing like there is now with blogs and, and podcasts and everything. There was nothing like that, you know. And it's, let's face it, now you have to listen to a lot of stuff on double speed. If you've got any time in the day, you know, you listen to the to podcast, you've got to listen to three or four or, or whatever, whatever it is, you know. And I think that, I think there was a lot, an incredible amount of pain and it was difficult to be an Arsenal fan, but I think people took things in a different way. And I'm not trying to say that they took it that was great because maybe it wasn't and maybe a lot of Arsenal, other Arsenal fans who invested more money than me and more time than me and more passion than I did, they would have something else to say about that. But And it did make you narky. I mean, you know, I don't remember, when, when did we lose that game in the Cup Winners' Cup final against, was it, Fibonacci? Gee, man, I was sitting with a load of guys that night and they were giving me nothing but shit. And I, I had that horrible pain like being a kid again. But you just took it. You know, I don't know if we take it. Do we take it so easily now? Oh no, there will be a million people coming online, Mills, you know, with their with their with their podcasts and with their live streams. And they want everybody in the team sold. Mills, thank you for providing that perspective. We had um at at points up to nine viewers. So I think people are enjoying what you said. And well, I, I found it educational for me. Two thousand miles away. Well, not quite two thousand, but nearly, you know what I mean. And um, you know, most of my um, most of my knowledge of Arsenal came when I came on board in 2006, and you know, I began began to read voraciously and to participate and to learn from.
people like you and George. George, um, what was that um, great fan of ours that started uh, Positively Arsenal with you? What's his name again? Frank. Frank. Frank taught me what it meant to be a fan. You're a fan for life. You're loyal yeah. to your club. You know, I want to say one thing is, I want to say one thing, which is like, you know, today as I was going through things, I thought about Ian Snelling, GF60. Yes. I've got all, he sent me the whole of his archive of his memories of the, before he died. Really? Of, of Arsenal. And I was looking at those and it made me feel really sad. Now that guy, he would have been, he, he would have really been incredible on this show. Yes. <laughs> because his memories went back to 1947. And he talked about the time we got beaten up by Tottenham fans. He yes. was only 10 years old. He was <laughs> utterly insane. Yeah, I used to read his articles. I always read his articles, by the way. And uh, it made me feel very sad to think. And I don't know what to do with that archive. You know, they're all there, all these memories. And they went back a long while. They're all just sitting there, you know. So. You need to write a book. That's what you need to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, you know, guys, I, I want to thank you. I want to thank you, Mills, yeah. especially. Well, thanks for having me on. I hope it was okay. And like I said, I'm not the guru. I'm not the most passionate Arsenal fan. I'm not the longest. I haven't bought the most kits. I haven't been to the most games. But... It's just a perspective, and everybody, everybody has to me has a little perspective, and they're all part of the bigger story, the big stream of what Arsenal is. You know, yes, that, that's all. You know, it was, it was unique and it was interesting, and you know, and it got very, very good to be an Arsenal fan for a long time. It was fantastic. You know, <laughs> even in the years when we weren't winning anything, it was still fantastic. I remember meeting this couple when we lived in Berlin, and uh, and they were scousers, and they were in the local shop. I was going to get some booze at the time. It's a long time ago now, but and uh, and they. I told them, I said, have you seen the results tonight? Blah, blah, blah. And I told them what Liverpool had done. And they said, who do you support? And I said, Arsenal. They said, oh, we love Arsenal. We can't stop watching them. They're so fantastic. And that's when I really knew that, although we weren't winning anything, we were, we were you know, we seemed to be respected. Maybe that was only one person. Everybody else thought we were shite or something. But we were playing such fantastic football. And, you know. Those members, come, George, I, I, I mean, come, I will I say this, back. Mills. Mills Sorry. Yeah. and George and Wenger Rule, if you can hear me. The memories of us playing fantastic football will never go away. It is indelible in our memories. And that is something we should aspire to. Thank you very much, Mills. Yes, thanks a lot. Thanks for Thank you, me. George. Take care of you. Thank yourself. you, Ben Garula. It was a pleasure having you. And thanks to all these people who tuned in and who will be listening to this as a podcast or seeing this live stream on YouTube or on Periscope and Twitter. If you're on YouTube, hit that smash that like button and subscribe. We need your support. Thank you very much. Bye. This concludes another edition of the Positively Uncensored Arsenal podcast. Show your appreciation of our podcast by subscribing and clicking the like button wherever you listen. This really helps in growing our support among honest and biased fans who recognize that Wenger's legacy is fundamental. Free-flowing attacking football by a club with integrity and class. Thanks for listening.